Hello, my name is Scott Kuhn. You may know me from my short stories or from my debut novel, Lost Helix. In this video, I share one of my short stories. No matter how hard he tried, Nate couldn't hear anything over the machine drilling into the ice. Just a few yards away, Mr. Torres yelled and grinned while Nate's dad grimaced and kicked at the crown of a tree. The rest of the tree remained submerged in the frozen snow with its roots planted in the soil far below. It was tall and strong, but only a tiny sprig of evergreen escaped, reaching out for what little light seeped through the never parting clouds above. It was a little miracle and his dad was kicking it. Pointing down, dad yelled to Nate's cousin, we'll come back for that. Brian yelled back from where he stood with the drill's remote kill switch. Yes, Mr. Bob. It was always Mr. Bob at work. Normally, work was digging up trees for lumber, trading it with other communities and nomadic groups. But today, they worked for Mr. Torres, tunneling down to some old government building, one buried by the century of storms, just like the trees in the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. If they found the building, and if, it, and if his dad let him, Nate would get a break from digging up trees and get to work with Mr. Torres instead. A crunch resounded from below. The massive iron arms of the drilling machine pulled the wide shaft from the ice and backed away. In the fresh silence, Dad and Mr. Torres peered down the gently angled tunnel. Mr. Torres threw his hands in the air creating music with the synthetic fibers of his jacket. Right on target. Dad straightened his spine and cast an eye towards Nate's older brother, Robbie, now climbing down from the drilling machine. Of course it's on target. My boy drilled it. Nate meandered over to the battered evergreen sprig. His ear still fixed on his father. He undid some of the damage with his foot. The stranger clapped a hand on his dad's caribou-clad shoulder. Worth every slip we promised. After I'm done here, of course. Little green slips grew into sweet potatoes, like the white potatoes Nate's community already had. But these potatoes were orange and full of vitamins, good for the body and good for trade. Dad shook Mr. Torres's hand off his shoulder. Awful generous for some old weather news. Mr. Torres went back to gazing down the tunnel. That is a weather research facility down there. Most of our records were wiped out in the century of storms and the wars. The information down there is invaluable. Long ago, global warming melted the ice caps, altered ocean currents, and sent the jet stream wobbling. Then it started to rain. It rained across entire continents for months at a time, then years, then always. With so little sunlight getting through the thick cloud cover, it got cold. The rain turned to snow, and the century of storms began. So did the wars to invade the south, where the sun still shined a couple weeks a year. Nate's dad asked, what do the South American states want with some old weather news anyway? Mr. Torres almost clapped the dad's shoulder again, but pulled back at the last moment. By studying history, we hope to avoid the same mistakes. Dad snorted. Good luck with that. In addition to the slips, I'll give you the glass for your greenhouse. Just lend me that brilliant son of yours for a while. Mr. Torres winked at Nate as if his dad had already agreed. Nate knew better. So do we have a deal? Nate froze. His dad looked past him, pretending to watch the men breaking down the drilling shaft. But Nate felt it. I seen better look he got every time he turned the TV on for everyone. A device of slop. But Nate didn't react. He remained still. A white rabbit in snow. Two weeks? Dad coughed, grumbled, and spit. My son is part of our survival. We all are up in the north. And you want maybe two weeks? Mr. Torrey said, Is it true he once brought a mainframe online? Not easy, those mainframes. Dad released a series of noises. None of them happy. His technology skills are important to me. My glass is important to your settlement. I'll think about it on the way back. 
With the drill stowed and towed, Nate got in the seat behind Robbie in their track-wheeled flatbed truck. His dad put it in gear and followed the heavy truck belching black specters as it dragged the drilling rig across the tundra. Having recovered so many old movies and TV shows, the irony of that black smoke was not lost on Nate. Surviving the Ice Age, using the machines that caused it. But there was no more damage to be done, not enough people left to do it. Nate would have to walk a cold hundred miles to find the next settlement. He looked out the back window at Mr. Torres on his electric snowmobile. He was one of the lucky ones. Living in the south where summer still happened, Nate was one of the unlucky ones. His forefathers weren't in the military armada that invaded South America. There's descendants still living down there. And they weren't on the rockets that escaped into space. Their progeny probably still up there in orbiting terrariums. After a long silence, Nate said, I could help him, I guess. I don't trust him, Dad shifted in his seat. The Sass are monsters. Whole settlements wiped out because the South wanted some, something that was under them in the ice. Robbie said, and the African Union nuked Siberia for some crazy reason. Or not. How would we know? It's just nomad stories. And what if those stories are true? Dad hungered down into his vast steering wheel. We should just let them have their weather research facility and leave us out of it. Robbie clenched his jaw. Mr. Troyes gave us just one pane of that glass, and the greenhouse is already 0 0.75 degrees warmer. That's what's true. And those sweet potatoes he made, everyone felt like they were in one of Nate's coffee commercials. Nate loved it when he recovered old TV shows with commercials in them. They were like mini documentaries about everyday life before humanity broke the world. The Goodman clan sometimes joked about the commercials, like miraculous coffee that transformed a human sloth into a dynamo with one sip. The invigorating sweet potatoes weren't so dramatic, but everyone felt the difference. Dad said, and if that's what he did, put coffee in them, then all we got is a bunch of ugly roots. And the glass, Robbie said. Another grumpy cauldron bubbled until three words escaped. Think about it. And there's the cloak of engine noise. Nate muttered, that means no. Out of the gray materialized Mr. Torres's metal house and the military flatbed that carried it. Its array of wind turbines mixed with the adjacent forest of spinning blades that powered Nate's home beneath the ice. Beside the two clusters of windmills stretched a bowl, 50 yards wide. Nate's forefather, Robert Goodman I, carved that bowl into the ice, exposing the roof of the apartment building below. Down inside, a heavy machine lowered a log into the top of an elevator shaft for drying, while on the far side, three women prepared to drive off with the lumber they had bartered for. Dad stopped the truck and Robbie jumped out. He jogged toward the women before forcing himself into a more casual stride. The youngest of the women stood on the far edge of the bowl, her sisters demanding that they leave now. Robbie stopped at his edge and watched their truck drive off into the gray. Nate and Brian ran past Robbie down the slope of the bowl, through the top floor apartment turned greenhouse, and down into the mudroom to undress. A meal of soy porridge and caribou jerky awaited them in the community apartment. But before Nate could eat, everyone needed him to turn the TV on. Tonight's entertainment came from an iPad recovered from the lower floors of their building. Nate hooked it in and brought up the only movie that he'd found on it, Point Break. As he ate, there was that feeling again. Nate's dad stood at the back of the apartment, glowering. Shrouded within his extended family, Nate ate slower and slower, but it did no good. This movie had too many beach scenes, too much sun, and other things his dad didn't like looking at. He soon pulled Nate away to go across the hall to study his Spanish. And don't forget about that pig for your brother's wedding feast, was the last thing his dad said before shutting the door. Surrounded by technical manuals, Nate dropped the Spanish language book across his lap and tried to not think about the pig. He wasn't good at Spanish and he wasn't good at drilling. When the storms hit, no one saved the farm animals. A few miles out from their apartment building, a slaughterhouse full of frozen pigs waited beneath the ice. Nate's family saved them for special occasions. 
like Robbie's wedding. As his brother and best man fell to me to drill for the wedding pig, he was going to screw it up. Robbie opened the door. Rushing up for your future bride? Nate curled his lip at the book. A language I don't get for a bride I never met. Robbie looked off like he was gazing across that bowl again. You're not supposed to meet your bride before the wedding, in case you hate each other. Robbie came in and shut the door. It's happening to me too, you know. And what would you do instead? Marry one of our cousins? Steal a girl from the nomads? What choice we got? Nate hunched over his book. None. Dad tells us what to do and we do it no matter how much we hate it. Dad does his best for us, for everyone. Like with your TV thing. It's all about survival for him. He doesn't get that TV helps us rest. After Mom died, he... Robbie looked away. He did his best. He did his best to get rid of me. I'll be that guy from that other settlement. You're Robbie Goodman the Fourth. You'll be Mr. Bob someday, running this place. Nate glared at the meaningless scribbles of the language book. I'll be nobody. I, Robbie took a half step closer. I could help you with the pig. No, you can't. You'll need a new shaft into pen 1A before you can reach another pig. Nate gripped the pages until they bent. There were only so many pigs. If some got tore up by the drill, which was likely to happen if Nate drilled it, then someone somewhere down the line would not get their wedding. I'm your best man. If I don't date out myself, myself, Dad will put me out on the ice with the nomads. The door flew open and Dad bellowed, Damn right I will! Don't even think about failing your brother! Nate buried his face in the book. I wasn't. And you! Dad slapped Robbie in the chest with something heavy. Keep this with you at all times. Robbie held the object out in front of him. It was the journal. Seeing it, Nate forgot about the book in his lap, the pig under the ice, and the man from South America. This wasn't supposed to happen until Robbie's wedding day. The first pages of that thick, leather-bound tome bore the writing of Robert Goodman the first, and the last filled-in pages were his father's. Robbie would continue to fill them in with births, deaths, marriages, and any other event of note for the Goodman Club. Robbie's eyes fluttered at it. Dad, I, I'm honored. Uncomfortable thing been jammed up under my coat for decades. Dad scratched at its lasting impression. It's your responsibility now. Robbie stared at him, slack jawed. This was not the ceremonious transfer he'd imagined. Nate knew it. And after a lingering moment, their dad knew it too. Their dad dropped his shoulders and walked to the floor. He turned to the door but paused. And you, in this glass. The boys waited while their father grumbled. Okay, but his rig ain't rolling out of here until we get that glass. His glass or his ass. Dad left and shut the door behind himself. The dig site came into view sooner than expected. Mr. Torres had been busy erecting wind turbines around the drill hole and a satellite dish. Nate's face lit up. Robbie smiled at him from the driver's seat. What do you think the dish is for? Nate shrugged, probably transmitting the data back instead of taking it on a hard drive. Robbie shrugged too. They pulled up to the mouth of the tunnel. Before Nate could get out, Robbie said, don't feel pressured. We get the glass regardless of if you fix that computer or not. He's paying for your time. Nate raised his chin. If that server's hard drive is fixable, I'll fix it and get the data. And if he lets me, I'll transmit it too. Maybe I'll get to poke around any other satellites up there, find some old TV shows stored on them, and then maybe I'll, I can come back later, find even more. Robbie chuckled. If you do, don't tell Dad. He'll make us fill the hole in keep you from wasting time. There's more to life than survival. Yeah, well, when you're the head of the family, you can't lose sight of that. <sighs> Robbie's hand absently moved to his chest and the journal under his caribou hides. Nate said no. They hugged and Nate got out. As Robbie drove off to the day's work site, Nate followed the cables 
down the frozen tunnel to the shattered front door and the lobby beyond. A new laptop sat on the security desk, a screen listing satellites passing overhead. Despite the cold, Nate removed his glove and touched the frame of the computer's screen. An invisible tether ran from his fingertips up through the clouds and touched the technology in the sky. His heart raced. The door behind the security desk opened. Nate yanked his hand away. Mr. Torres came out. He had no coat. Hi, Nate. Come on. You can help me back there. Nate followed him down a long hall of secured doors and wet floors. Mr. Torres had set up heat panels all the way down. Nate loosened his coat. You seem to know your stuff. Why do you need me, Mr. Torres? Call me Juan. And I need you because you are familiar with this technology better than I am. It's old. You've been playing with it. I've only read books. Nate pulled his coat open and raised his face to the sky. His apartment never got this high. Good to be warm, huh? Bad luck being born in the north. Nate lowered his head. Dad says we're lucky to be born at all. Says it's our duty to stay alive for humanity. A lot of pressure for a kid, Nate grimaced. I'm 16. Mr. Torres opened the door at the end of the hall. When I was 16, all I wanted to do was lie on the beach. You were on a beach? Without a coat? Mr. Torres grinned. I wore only short pants, and I went in the water. It was 80 degrees, by your measure. Our summers are getting longer down there. Almost two months some years. Nate stared off into his movies, trying to do more than just see them. 80 degrees. He couldn't imagine. Mr. Torres took his shoulder and led Nate into the warm, warm room. Nate had to take his coat. Mr. Torres stood amongst the consoles and laptops that filled the small space. This was supposed to be a peak interglacial period, the warmest it gets. We predict man's ice age will start to end up here in a century. Nate deflated. Not in my lifetime. Buck up, kid. You get to be warm today. Mr. Torres slugged him in the arm like they were in a black and white era TV show. Here's the console you'll be working on. I already broke its password, but that's as far as I got. Why don't you check it out while I finish what I was doing? Nate sat down and clicked the power button. The monitor came to life. Thanks to whatever Mr. Torres had done, the computer flashed past the login screen to the desktop. Another screen popped up, asking for username, password, and uplink address. Uplink? Nate pushed his chair away from the desk. This isn't a data server. This is a satellite control terminal. Mr. Torres nodded as he came to his feet. Yeah, I left that part out when I was talking to your dad. I guess I forgot to mention it to you. The data isn't on a server. It's on a satellite. Nate stood up. I have to tell my dad. I should probably tell him before I do anything. Your dad is a little technophobic. I saw how he acted when I mentioned that mainframe you found. So I thought it best to leave that detail out. Don't you think so? Mr. Torres spread a warm grin across his face. And call me Juan. Nate turned toward the door. If he told his dad, that would be the end. He'd be back drilling ice tomorrow. No computers, no warmth. But what if his dad was right about the sass? What if the nomads were right? Whole communities wiped out because they were in the sass's way. But if that were true, why was this guy here alone, giving them glass for their greenhouse? It didn't seem like something you'd do before attacking a community. And it was so warm in here, warmer than Nate had ever been. What if these would be the only warm days in his entire life? He turned back to Mr. Torres. What are you doing, really? We're still getting data, it's just from a satellite. Nate narrowed his eyes. What satellite? A deep frown spread across Mr. Torres's face. I guess I can tell you, but you can't tell anyone ever. It's the orbiter station. Nate took a step back. You want to contact the people living in orbit? No, no, no. They died long ago, froze to death up there instead of down here. 
Poor foals. Mr. Torres shook his head at the ceiling. It was only assumed that people were still alive up there. The progeny of the elite who had escaped the collapsing climate. Even if their space station was truly self-sustaining, there were a lot of things that could go wrong over a couple of hundred years. The more Nate thought about it, the more it made sense that they'd all be dead by now. What do you want with their space station, he asked. They took farming technology with them. It's still in their computers. You lied about the weather data, too? Mr. Torres shrugged. shrugged. I changed a couple of details to avoid troubling your father. I was being polite. Nate looked through the door again. Mr. Torres said, The information in their computers could help us grow enough food to bring everyone down to South America. All the scattered communities like yours. Please, Nate. I don't know if I can do this alone. I failed before, and you're some kind of genius. Help me do this, and I'll promise you passage south. Really? If we get what I came for, yes. I'll take you with me when I head home. Nate gazed at the terminal. He imagined stepping through that screen onto a warm beach. But he couldn't just walk away from his arranged marriage to the Ortiz clan and leave his dad and Robbie to deal with the broken trust between the settlements. All of us. My whole settlement gets to go. Mr. Torres stressed out his hand. Done! Nate just looked at it, so Mr. Torres grabbed Nate's hand and shook. Now let's see what you can do about establishing an uplink. And call me Juan. While Mr. Torres sat back, Nate dug in. After a couple hours, he had a link to the space station above, but only to one node. Though the batteries had almost no charge, he managed to turn on several devices, including a camera, into the lab area. This had once been a science module. Now it was dead. The video showed a large hole into space. Mr. Torres stood behind Nate as they both gawked at the image. Mr. Torres shook Nate's shoulders. I knew you were a genius. Nate brought up a status screen. I've aligned the solar panels and got the main batteries charging better. We should leave it until tomorrow. Start with a full battery. He turned off the camera. Very good. Thank you so much, Nate. Nate. Can't wait to see what you find tomorrow. Nate spent the night dreaming of charging batteries and the things they might turn on. The next morning, he woke before everyone and took Mr. Torres's extra snowmobile. Inside the facility, he tore off his caribou hide and dove in. Finding the battery ready, Nate started turning things on, the camera first. Anxious to get south, are we? Nate glanced up as Mr. Torres removed his coat. Did you know the Orbiter Space Station really isn't a space station at all, but like a whole bunch of satellites and stations stuck together? Mr. Torres chuckled. Yes, they were in a hurry. This terminal is connected to just the one module, but I think I can get access to everything, maybe, maybe, if things are connected up to each other and still working up there. Mr. Torres stood behind Nate's clacking keys. We've been researching all aspects of the century of storms, he said. The orbiters are the most responsible. They are the descendants of the corporate captains and the politicians that they bribed. But they all froze long ago. Ironic justice, I'd say. Nate paused to glare at the video of the gaping hole into space, imagining the horror of being in that room when that breach opened. It must have been cold, but not cold enough for the people who did this to Nate and everyone else. As he stared, the video distorted, then locked. A plume of smoke and fire filled half of the lingering image. All other data vanished. Mr. Torres cried, not again. Nate's fingers moved frantically. I'll fix it, I'll fix it. Forget it, kid, we're done. Mr. Torres reached for his laptop. Nate blocked him. But there's other stuff up there. I can fix this. This terminal was for that satellite, and that satellite is gone. You saw the fire, he huffed. I have to pack up, go try somewhere else. Give me a chance. Nate's eyes moved to the console already mapping a strategy. I can find something else to connect to up there. Something that'll work with this terminal. I'm sure of it. Give me a day. Mr. Torres folded his arms. I don't see the point, but okay. See what you can do. I can't leave until I pack anyway. 
while Mr. Torres went back to his metal house. Nate went back to work. They worked nonstop into the night, trying frequency after frequency, protocol after protocol, and nothing worked. He stayed at it until his brain folded, forcing him to head home. Everyone there was fast asleep, and they were still asleep when Nate woke early the next morning and left again. Back in the facility, Nate fired ping after ping at the massive menagerie above, but nothing came back. And Mr. Torres was no help. He only stopped by to tell Nate that he'd be leaving the next morning. Nate worked harder. The next time the door opened, it was Robbie. Warm in here. Nate didn't look up from his console. Yeah. Didn't see you at dinner or breakfast. Yeah. Robbie took a step closer. Everyone was wondering about you last night. We had a heck of a time turning on the TV. Had to watch Point Break again. Yeah. Nate leaned closer to his console. A ping was answered. But did he really have a connection to the satellite? Nate sent the ping again and waited. Robbie inched even closer. It's been weird not seeing you at the work site today and yesterday. How's that weather data coming? Nate's mouth opened, but he didn't speak. Lost in the work, he'd forgotten that Mr. Torres had lied about the data and where it was. Nate closed his mouth. The ping came back again. Nate double-checked everything. It had to be the orbiter station. He needed to tell Mr. Torres, but first he needed to prove it. Nate's fingers touched the keys, but his brother spun his rolling office chair away. Holding Nate still, Rob looked him hard in the eyes. You're not being you. You're normal you. Rob chuckled again. Is anything wrong? Nate swallowed. Robbie kept staring at him until he answered with a vague shrug. Robbie released Nate's shoulders and straightened up. It's getting late. Let's head back. Get some food in you. Nate turned back to the terminal. If you want that greenhouse glass, I've got to do this. You gotta eat. I gotta do this. Robbie lingered, but Nate kept his eyes on the screen until he heard the door click. Glancing up at the empty room, a sour gunk dripped through his guts. He wanted to tell Robbie everything, but then Robbie would have to tell Dad. And then what? Nate got back to work. I've got to do this. Nate had connected to a weather satellite hooked into the rest of the orbiter station by a makeshift data spine. The spine granted access to the greater arc of machines. Nate cataloged everything he could find up there. Every computer, every rocket, every tank of rocket fuel, including the only tank with unspoiled fuel in it. He even cataloged all the carbon scrubbers. The next morning, Nate presented the catalog to Mr. Torres. Mr. Torres jabbed a finger at the screen. That's it! That server says Skunk Works, Nate glared at Mr. Torres. I know what Skunk Works was, and it ain't farming. Mr. Torres spread another warm smile. It's a Skunk Works computer, but the data is farming. Nate narrowed his eyes. Caribou crap. Mr. Torres took a dramatic breath. Okay, it's weapons. We we're only defending ourselves. The African Union found ICBMs. Tested one on Siberia. With this, we can shoot their missiles down. Nate turned away. Dad was right. The SAS were liars. Was anything Mr. Torres said true? Was taking his clan south really true? Nate put on his coat. I'm rescuing your entire settlement, Mr. Torres said. When they get south, don't you want them to be safe from the AU? Nate paused at the door. Mr. Torres was a liar, but if there was any chance at all of escaping this endless winter, how could he walk away from that? I can't get into a Skunk Works server without help. I'm going to search the other rooms for invasive software. I expect there's some, since this is actually a military base that we drilled into for you. Nate snorted, mimicking his father. Or are you going to tell me I won't find any because this is a weather facility like you said? Mr. Torres didn't answer. Nate snorted again. I thought so. He left. After hours of breaking into cabinets, Nate found firewall breaching software sent here for testing. 
He shook his head at the test schedule. Now centuries behind. Better late than never. He took the software and manuals back to the control room. When he opened the door, there was Dad, his wide eyes roaring like diesel engines. How could you? Dad, I, I was... Do you never listen to me? His father's hands curled, resisting the desire to become fists. Everything I do is for you boys, and this is how you repay me? Nate couldn't speak. He could barely think. Everything Nate was doing was for everyone. But how could he explain it to his dad? Does tradition mean nothing to you? Does he mean nothing to you? Nate blinked. Wait, what? Dad brought his fist down hard on the console, rattling the electronics within. How could you let your brother dig his own pig? Nate emptied his hands into a pile on the floor. I, I didn't know. You didn't know. You didn't know? You're down here with all, all this? His father kicked the rolling chair into the wall. That's why you didn't know. But this is important, Nate's face contorted as he searched for a place between telling and not telling. It's more than just greenhouse glass. It's important. You wouldn't know important if it bit you on the ass. But of what I'm doing here, it's a distraction. Dad grabbed the dusty keyboard and cracked it across the desk. Black keys ricocheted from every wall. That's all you are, an endless distraction from what's important. I can't get you married off soon enough. Nate clenched his teeth. Tears flooded his cheeks. He was not a son. He was a thing to be traded. What if I don't want to marry a girl I never met? Do you want our bloodline to end? Did I suffer this life so you could throw yours away on toys? I am trying to help everyone. By refusing Ortiz, you only help yourself. Every part of Nate's father shook through his heavy layers of hide. If you don't marry that girl and dig your own pig, you can follow the nomads. Nate screamed, you don't understand anything. Then he ran out of the facility and across the tundra. Sideways sleep ripped at his face, winds leached all feeling from his fingers. Still Nate ran into the gathering gloom until his failing lungs brought him to his knees. Behind him, fresh snow filled in his tracks. If he didn't get up and go back, he could die out here. Nate gave himself another minute. As he trudged back, nightfall closed around him like an iron maiden. Nate tightened his hood and buried his hands in the layers of hide. His tracks were gone. With nothing to guide him, Nate had to keep his path straight. If he missed the facility, he'd be dead by morning. He imagined himself kneeling in the snow, an ice statue for his father and brother to weep over. That would show Dad. The smell of porridge dragged Nate out of his dream. He pulled his face off the console. Robbie poured warm lumps into a cold cup. You haven't been home. Thought you should eat. Nate wiped his eyes. Thanks, but wine brings food. Wine? Robbie's lips tightened. Well, I brought you not food, too. He started to open the door, but stopped. You know, Nate, Dad hasn't had a lot of good in his life. And since we lost Mom, all he has is us. Nate hunched into his computer. But he would throw me out on the ice with the nomads for not letting him sell me to the Ortiz clan. Robbie melted. That's not how it is. That's how it feels. Well, maybe this will change how it feels. Robbie opened the door. On the other side, swaddled in caribou fur, was an angelic face. Nate gathered his jaw from the floor and managed to speak two words. Is that? Robbie didn't answer. He simply guided Clara Ortiz into the room and left. It's two 16-year-olds locked eyes in silence until Nate broke away, checking the progress of his incursion software. There was none. He checked it some more. Claire drifted around the small room behind him. Do you know how to work all these machines? Nate glanced up, but only for a moment. Some. I could learn the rest, I guess. My brothers like you already. They say you will bring entertainment. 
She moved from desk to desk as if taking inventory, her hands never leaving her pockets. They like tech too, but they only know radios. They are putting up a big antenna. They say they will talk to Russia. They say I should learn Russian, but Russian is hard. Neat type something. He didn't know what. Your English is good. Better than my Spanish. Sorry. He gave her a wincing smile. I'm trying. Clara smiled back and looked away. I'll help you. If you need it still. After. Yeah, that would be nice. The door opened and Robbie stuck his head in. Sorry, kids. Gotta get her back before the dads find out. If I can, I'll sneak her over again in the morning. So say goodbye and be quick about it. Robbie went back out. Looking down, Clara nodded. I'm not supposed to be here. Nate tried to say something nice, maybe a compliment, but all that came out was, yeah. Clara opened the door. She paused, her eyes still on the floor. Your brother told me about your being upset about the arrangement. I didn't want to either, but I'm glad that you are nice and handsome and... And Claire ran out. Nate stared at the closing door. A warm feeling rose through him. Did that really happen? Was she really so nice? Or was that just what puberty does to your brain the first time you meet a woman that you're not related to? Still staring at the door, Nate definitely felt warm differently warm, but not 80 degrees on a beach warm. He put his fingers back on the keys. I've got to do this. The rest of the day was filled with failure. One error message after another told Nate that the firewall breaching software hadn't been worth its testing schedule. Nate worked into the night, but no matter what tact he took, the Skunk Works server refused to yield. He ended up sleeping face down on the terminal once again. He woke to a slamming door and a red-faced Mr. Torres standing over him. Your father just woke me screaming about a pig. Why is he kicking me off your land over a pig? Pig, uh, Nate said, not really awake. Best man digs up the wedding pig and I'm first brother, so I'm best man, so I'm supposed to do it. Robbie did it because we needed a new shaft to 1A. And I was real so good. Mr. Torres scraped both hands through his hair. Whatever, he's making me leave tomorrow. Nate looked to the screen. It reported more failure. I can, uh, what? What can you do in one day? Can you access that server? Nate shrank. I thought so. Mr. Torres stomped back and forth. A pig, a pig, and nothing we can do. Wait, Mr. Torres loomed over Nate. Can you bring it down? What? If you can bring it down, a server should survive re-entry. And my people can recover it. Mr. Torres leaned harder. There was another lie in there. Nate could feel it. He stared. Mr. Torres hardened the eyes. I want Clara Ortiz to go too. And her clan. Done. But can you do it? Nate started typing. It was in that catalog I made. One good rocket with fuel. A few key clacks later, Nate folded his arms. Done. Mr. Torres got on his own laptop and tracked the descent. Perfect. He'll come down in the ocean near Argentina. You are a hero of the South American states. I will contact my people. Nate closed his eyes and dreamed of his future in the warm, warm South. You again! Nate opened his eyes. Someone had initiated a video connection with his console. It was a man in an ill-fitting dark blue suit, his collar softened by too many prior owners. The man looked past Nate as he continued. I thought you died at Area 51. Nate's whole body quaked. This couldn't be real. He refused to believe it until Mr. Torres tried to cut the video feed. Nate quickly blocked the keyboard. The man on screen said, So you got another chump to do your dead partner's job, Torres. What did you do to us this time? Another man appeared in the video. 
He wore a uniform stripped of everything except the five stars on each shoulder. It, too, was older than the man inside. Mr. President, that rocket they fired? It's bringing us down. We're falling out of orbit. Can we fix it? The soldier shook his head. And that explosion last month that damaged the shuttles? It'll take another week of repairs before we can survive reentry. I... His mouth kept moving, but no words came out. Nate had never felt so cold. What have I done? The president stuffed his face into the screen. What you've done is help this monster kill us all just like he always wanted. There are over a hundred children up here. Is it worth it, Major Torres, to have that on your soul just so you can build a stealth bomber? Mr. Torres said, don't feel bad, kid. It's their forefathers who destroyed the planet. Nate jumped up and seized Mr. Torres by his collar. You think I'm an idiot? Everyone drove cars. Everyone did this. Nate shoved him away and went back to the console. Maybe I can undo it. Mr. Torres kicked Nate's chair away from the terminal. From under his coat came a handgun. Stay out of this, kid. Nate gripped the arms of his chair. Shoot me and my family will never let you leave our land alive. Nate edged his chair toward the keyboard. Mr. Torres aimed for his head. The unexpected smell of caribou stew entered the room. They looked to the opening door. Seeing who it was, Mr. Torres kicked Nate's chair out from under him and seized Clara Ortez. Caribou stew splattered everywhere. Maybe you care if she dies. Nate jumped to his feet. Mr. Torres shoved the gun into Clara's throat. Nate stopped. I thought so. Now just let this happen, kid. Nate's eyes darted around the room, searching for something. He didn't know what, but when he found it, he was going to hit Mr. Torres with it so hard. The door opened again. Mr. Torres dragged Clara to the blind side of the door frame. Robbie entered, his eyes on his brother. Hey, Nate, where's Clara? Mr. Torres struck Robbie from behind, sending him to the floor. Robbie got back up, his fists ready. Mr. Torres fired. Robbie flopped to his back. He was not moving. You monster! Nate lunged. Mr. Torres hurled Clara into him. The two teens crashed to the floor. Mr. Torres aimed. Nate covered Clara with his body. Clara's tiny hand gripped Nate's shoulder. Mr. Torres sneered as he centered his pistol on Nate's forehead. Then Mr. Torres crumbled to the floor unconscious. Standing over him with a blood-stained chunk of ice in his hand was Nate's dad. Nate said, Dad, what? Why? Brian told me he saw your brother driving that Ortiz girl, so I... Dad stopped and threw the bloody ice aside. What in the name of holy freaking hell is going on down here? Nate could breathe again, but it didn't last. He scrambled to his brother's side. The wound. He had to find the wound before his brother lost too much blood. But there was no blood. Nate tore open Rob's layers. He found the bullet. It had drilled through the caribou hide and into the leather-bound history of the Goodman clan, where it stuck in the pages. Robbie grabbed his chest. Holy crap, what hit me? A siren bellowed across the video feed, pulling all eyes to it. Dad squinted at the man on the screen. What's that, one of your TV things? Over a hundred children. Everyone down here was safe, but over a hundred children. Nate got back on the keyboard. I can fix this, Mr. President, but you have to give me full access now. Nate positioned his shaking hands over the keys. The president looked to his general, general, but all he got was upturned palms. The president typed, then grimaced through the screen. There, access. Nate steadied his hands as best he could and started. Dad blinked at them. He's real? The president glared at Dad. I'm real and all the people your son helped that man-man to kill are real too. You are not going to die. Nate's fingers danced over the keys. I'm venting all your bad fuel. You're lucky those relief valves are pointing down. Sir, the soldier grabbed the president's shoulder. We're stabilizing. At a lower orbit, Nate sat back, a grin tugging at the corners of his mouth. It won't last, but I bought you time. And I fixed your other problem too. The president squinted. What other problem? I used that access to delete your weapons data. 
the SAS won't come looking for it anymore. And like I said, your new orbit won't last, so you might want to fix those shuttles and come down here with the rest of us. Enjoy the weather. Nate cut the video feed. Dad stood over him, his jaw hung low. Nate, I don't know what all that was, but at a loss, his dad simply smiled. Clutching the family history in one hand and his chest in the other, Robbie came to his feet. Clara hurried to help him. Don't worry, Dad. He'll explain it to us later. But we better get this young lady back before she's missed. Robbie took Clara up and put her in the truck. Nate and his dad dragged the unconscious Mr. Torres up the tunnel by his ankles. Reaching the small ring of vehicles above, they let his legs drop into the snow. Nate turned to his father. So what do we do with him? Dad shrugged. Healthy male his age? Nomads will pay a whole caribou for him, I expect. Nate straightened up. Won't these people come looking for him? We'll point his rig south, said a crawling dad nodded. Nomads will take it, find it. His people will go after the rig. Never trace it here. No one will come here. Nate looked to his feet. I'm sorry I lied and yelled. And everything with Ortiz and stuff. Yeah, well, I'm sorry I didn't listen until you started yelling. He put a hand on Nate's shoulder. I've been so busy telling everyone what to do, maybe I forgot how to listen. Nate kept staring at his feet, unsure if he really heard those words come from his dad. The rising sun warmed the day despite the relentless clouds. A few yards away, that evergreen sprig struggled to become a tree again. The small satellite dish blocked what little light was to be had. His father walked over and kicked the dish out of the way. Maybe we can leave that. See if it attracts caribou. Then maybe we can pen them. Raise them for meat and all. Have more food. A better life for everyone. Like what you're doing with your TV thing. Maybe it's time to do more than just survive. Maybe give everyone more time for your TV stuff, maybe. Nate's breath got stuck in his throat. Did his dad just say that? Was this moment real? Or was Nate still in the facility, still sleeping on the console? A cold wind whipping across his face told him this was very real. But he wanted to be sure. So he remained still. A white rabbit in the snow. I hope you enjoyed this video. For more about me, my published works, and for some writing advice, go to scottcoonsci-fi.com and losthelix.com. Please remember to like and subscribe, and leave comments below. Thank you.